And with that, um, Roger, do you want to go ahead and get us kicked off with some opening remarks on the last few decades of animal welfare? I'm just getting my document up and make sure it works okay. I think it's okay. So um, yeah, hi Earthlings. So this is um, a brief introduction to the concept of new welfareism. Now the crude distinction that we draw between animal welfare and animal rights is that uh, animal rights is about ending animal use and animal welfare is about the humane treatment of other animals while they are being used. Uh, most animal advocates at this point say, well, okay, so that puts me in the rights camp because I too want to end animal use. So this is where the concept of new welfareism comes in. The advocates say, well, I'm certainly not a welfareist. I don't align myself, for example, with the RSPCA in Britain or the ISPCA in Ireland or the Humane Society uh, of the United States, for example. So there is this kind of concept which kind of bridges the gap between what's called traditional welfare and animal rights uh, or animal liberation even. And that concept is uh, not very well liked in the movement, and yet it's valid in many respects. And it's been around since 1996, uh, when it was uh, coined and developed by a legal scholar. There's been modifications to the concept since 1996, uh, but the basic idea is this, that while rejecting traditional or classical animal welfareism, RSPCA, etc., the modern day animal movement embraces a new or neo welfareist position. A position that seeks the abolition of animal use, but as a long term goal, while embracing welfare reforms, such as moves from, for example, moving from battery, ba barren battery cages to enriched ones, or promoting the controlled atmosphere, stunning or killing of other animals rather than them having their throats cut in houses of slaughter. So I think that modern day animal advocates may not recognize themselves as new welfareists. Maybe they'll say, well, maybe Peter will favor a campaign like gassing chickens in Canada, for example, but they themselves will not. However, even these same advocates appear to be committed to the use of welfare language to talk about what they say is animal rights. So the dominant talk in the animal movement is welfareist in nature. And we talk about the opposition to animal cruelty, our opposition to animal abuse. And we even say that we're animal lovers. In cultures that are as deeply speciesist as the ones in which these advocates operate, opposing animal cruelty and opposing animal abuse is a confusing message. For the culture of speciesism also says that causing animal cruelty is wrong, especially if causing unnecessary suffering, as opposed to necessary suffering, is involved. The ideology of speciesism also says that it opposes animal abuse. When the moral agents in a speciesist society hear that animal rights means not being cruel to other animals and not abusing them, they hear the message that they already agree with. The solution for them then is to make reforms that eliminate the cruelty and to stop the abuse. They start from a position that animal use is not a problem. It's how other animals are treated while being used that's the problem. So for them, in their ears as it were, why would stopping animal cruelty and animal abuse mean ending animal use and going vegan? When animal advocates say such things as the animal movement is about abolishing the worst forms of animal abuse, the speciesists couldn't agree more. When animal advocates get embroiled in arguments about the percentage of times that other animals are successfully rendered unconscious or stunned in houses of slaughter, the welfare response, in other words, the culture's response, is to say that reform should be introduced to make the stunning more efficient. Or they might say, let's put cameras into slaughterhouses, and that should do the trick. So this session today then, is to explore the rather bizarre idea that the animal rights movement should be based on animal rights. And that to achieve that goal, at least some parts of the movement must, and this is coining a phrase that came from Tom Reagan 
and Gary Francione in 1992, we must believe that a movement's means creates its ends. A movement's means creates its ends. The caveat that I would add is that the movement's language sets out its stall clearly and consistently, or could do. It reduces confusion in the recipients of the message, or could do, if we, as it were, got it right. So, can we achieve animal rights through welfare talk? That's the question at first, I suppose, so let's talk. Yeah, that was great, Roger. Um, I mean, honestly, I think you covered most of both sides of the position um, from a, a, a larger respect and how they compare and contrast. What I'd like to do now is just maybe take a minute or two, literally, to share my experience with adopting a rights-based approach. And then we'll get into these question prompts and have some fun. So I would put myself in the camp of um, what Roger just described. I've been vegan six years. Um, and until 2018, I would consider myself an animal rights advocate, but I didn't actually fully understood, understand what that meant, specifically as framed by the originator of rights-based animal rights, Tom Reagan. And in the last couple of years, I've really found it beneficial, both at a theoretical and a practical level, to explore these things. And specifically because it's a clear and uncompromising message. And I mean, this is this applies to both my street work as well as um, on social media, the animal videos I do. I find having very clear language is helpful in that regard too. And really, to me, the strength of a rights-based approach is the focus on the individual their rights are not to be violated. And as Roger said, to have that clear message, I think really strengthens our position. That, that focus is, is really a key distinction between both the welfare and rights, as well as the utilitarian versus the rights-based view. Because the utilitarian philosophy is much more focused on interests, whereas the rights-based view is, is really down to the individual. And while interests are a part of that, it's not all of the, the focus. I think when we start to evaluate things based on our interests, it's really difficult not to lead towards a place that could lead towards immoral decision making, which is one of the key benefits, I think, of that, of that rights-based approach, because it really is clear and uncompromising in this regard. And I, I think, the thing to me that I think is, is really interesting about this is all these scenarios where we're talking about making calculations around interests and suffering and so on, they're all predicated on the idea that animal use is necessary, when I think most of us on this call, if not all of us, will agree that there's no biological requirement to eat or use other animals. So I'm curious what, what scenarios we're even talking about uh, when we ask these questions. Now to introduce how these two philosophies are different, first is a short clip from Peter Singer, who's probably best known for his book Animal Liberation, which was published in 1975. Um, philosophically, I'm not an animal rights advocate um, because I don't think that rights is the appropriate terminology to think about the issue. Um, I would think of it in terms of the, the question that you specifically asked me, in terms of equality, um, equality between humans and animals in a very specific sense. Because again, it's obvious that humans and animals are not politically equal. We couldn't give them the right to vote. Um, but, but there's a sense in which uh, I think they do share an important equality, and that is the capacity to suffer or to enjoy their lives. And I think that ought to lead to a, a moral equality in the sense that I think their pain ought to count just as much as the pain of a human being, where it's a similar amount of pain. This next clip is from Tom Reagan, the originator of rights-based animal rights, who authored The Case for Animal Rights in 1983. Here are some of his thoughts on utilitarianism. Will the objection be finally that no one has rights, not any human being and not any other animal either, but rather that right and wrong are a matter of acting to produce the best consequences, being certain to count everyone's interests and to count equal interests equally? This moral philosophy, utilitarianism, has a long and venerable history influential men and women, past and present, are among its adherents, and yet it is a bankrupt moral philosophy if ever there was one. Are we seriously, seriously, to inquire into the interests of the rapist before declaring rape wrong? Should we ask the child molester whether his interests would be frustrated before condemning the molestation of our children? Remarkably, a consistent utilitarianism demands that we ask these questions. 
and in so demanding relinquishes any claim on our rational assent.